Well, good morning. This uh, new series, the next few weeks leading up to Easter, um, we call it the Passion because we typically look at the period right leading up to Easter, the last week of Jesus' life is his Passion Week. And uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that, but uh, what, what I want to do is between now and then, I want to expand some of that and look at three or four of those different things as we lead to Easter. And so... Um, Today, we're going to look at what we would normally look at on Palm Sunday. It's not Palm Sunday, but, but it's the first thing that really launches this in. I want to look at that today, and uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll build up uh, looking at, at uh, as we get to Easter. But really, as I said a few weeks ago, this, more than anything, is a time period where Jesus clearly expresses his highest priorities as he's facing the cross. And so I want to do that today, and I'm going to read some scripture here. And, and, and this, this triumphal entry, Jesus coming into Jerusalem for the last time here before he's arrested, uh, is, is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so if you have a Bible, you're welcome to go to any one of those. I'm going to look at all four this morning. But in order to read that story, since all four of them record the same story but from very different perspectives... Uh, they all have different details. They all interject into the greater story. What I've done this morning is instead of reading all four of them, I've sort of taken them and compacted them into one story. So I'm going to take bits and pieces from all of them and put them into order. And I want to read that, okay? So if you're following along in, in one of the books there, uh, you won't have all of this. But just maybe just listen and, uh, and I'll read through this story. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country of Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast uh, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palms and went out to meet him. Now when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethany, Bethpage and Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her on which no one has ever sat. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone, uh, says, any, if, if anyone says anything to you, you will say, The Lord needs them, and they will send them back here immediately, and he will uh, send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a beast of burden. So the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told him, The Lord has need of it. And they let them go. And they brought the donkey and the colt and put, um, put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. And as he rode along, most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from palm trees and spread them on the road. But as he got close, on the way down from the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of disciples and the crowds that went before him and who followed him began to, pr to rejoice and praise God in a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. They shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now the crowd that had been with Jesus when he raised Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The chief priests made a plan to put Lazarus to death because on account of him, many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The reason why the crowd went out to meet Jesus was that they heard he had raised Lazarus from the grave. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that we're gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. 
And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you, Jerusalem, when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Let's pray. Our Father, as we dig into this scripture <clears throat> this morning, I ask that you would make it come alive to us. That not just understanding the story and understanding the cultural aspects of it, but God, uh, that we would see Jesus. So open our eyes this morning as we come with open minds. Uh, allow us to see who Jesus is and all of the things that are going on here as they come together and what this means for us. So God, we invite you to do your work here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There's two parallel things happening in this story at the same time. And um, they, they really don't have, they have everything to do with the other, but they really have no idea what's happening in the other. So on one hand, we have the people who are in Jerusalem and their preparations and them going out to meet Jesus. On the other hand, we have Jesus in, in Bethpage, Bethany, the, the Mount of Olives, who are preparing to come in Jerusalem and heading towards Jerusalem. And it's in the middle where these two crowds meet that where this story happens. And I want to look at that. And, and if, if you have your Bible, the, John talks about this in chapter 12. And I want to start there. Because in John chapter 12, verse 12, this is what he writes. This is how he starts. He says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, now that's the feast of the Passover. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The large crowd that had came to the, pe the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. There is a lot packed right in those two verses. I want to talk about some of that, but uh, it's really interesting here as we think about this, because Jesus wasn't on the donkey riding in, and crowds around him or people following him just didn't randomly cut branches and wave them and lay them down. Uh, they're in Jerusalem, and Jesus isn't. And they heard Jesus was coming to town, so what did they do? They gathered their palm branches and went out to meet him. That is incredibly significant. Here's why. A little bit of a cultural history here. There were was, there was several feasts that they recognized every year. And all of these feasts and these celebrations, all of them had an aspect to the past, to the present, and the future. Well, this feast... Uh, I want to talk about specifically is the Feast of Booths, or in some t places it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And that whole feast was really about one thing. It was about the coming Messiah. It, they, in the past part of it, they would recognize how in their need and in their desperate need, God continued to, to visit them and deliver them. And God provided for them, and God rescued them over and over and over. And part of this was this feast uh, that they would actually construct little booths or little tents, and they would live in them for the whole week of the celebration. And that was a, a physical reminder of the desperation and need for God. Uh, so they confined themselves to that. But this whole week involved lots of food and lots of feasts and lots of partying. partying. They celebrated the past of God's provision and rescue. In the, in the present part of it, they realized today we desperately need God's rescue. We need the Savior. And then in the future part, they would actually call out to God, asking for him to bring the deliverer, the salvation. 
And they would go through the streets as part of this. One of the things they did is they would cut these palm branches and myrtle branches and other branches, and they would wave them through the streets while they're singing or chanting or calling out Psalm 118. Now, I'm going to read a couple of verses from that. If you want to flip over there, you can. I won't wait for you. But Psalm 118, this is some of the things that they would say. This is what that psalm was. It's the psalm for the Feast of Booths. It says things like, Out of our distress we call to the Lord, and the Lord answers and sets us free. He says, uh, The Lord is my strength and my song. God is my salvation. Glad songs of salvation in the tents of righteousness. I thank you that you have answered me, God. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become this cornerstone. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. We bless you, Lord. This is the kind of, so feast of booths. Going through the street, waving palm branches, singing out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name. Okay, you got the picture? What's happening here? These people are cutting down palm branches, getting ready for this. It says that's exactly what they were singing and chanting, and they're running out to meet Jesus. Here's a problem. This isn't the Feast of Booths. Why in the world are they taking the physical exercises and the worship practices of that feast and doing them here? That is really odd. There's no reason for that. It doesn't make any sense. Um, But it's exactly what they're doing. It wasn't the right time of year. But you know what? I really believe that the people were waiting. They were waiting. They were ready that when this Messiah King came, they would rush out with the present tense part of this, proclaiming that the Messiah has come. So here on this day, the people hear that Jesus is coming, and they get ready with the Feast of Booth activities. Interesting? They're saying, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if you, if you went on your, your internet and you googled the word Hosanna to find the definition, uh, the first thing that will come up is it's going to tell you that it means, yay, hooray, praise him. That's, that's what, but you know what? That's not what the word means. That's how our culture has twisted it around and how we use it today. But that's not what the word means. The word actually, Hosanna actually means God save us now. It's a call of desperation. It's a, it's a we are desperately in need of de- deliverance. God save us is what Hosanna means. So what are they saying when they say Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, rescue us. We're longing and calling for the one who will come from God himself to rescue us. In Matthew, Matthew says that this is what they say when they were, when they were waving the palm branches. He says, they said, rescue us. You are the son of David coming in the name of the Lord. Mark says, they said, rescue us. Today is the kingdom of David has come. In, in Luke, he says, rescue us, Messiah, who comes in the name of the Lord. And in John, he says, it's rescue us, you are the king of Israel. The present tense, feast of booths, you are here now. Today is the day. Rescue us, save us. It's the call for the Messiah from the festival of booths that they're fitting in here So my question is, is the crowd just stirred up and worked up in the emotion of Jesus and all this stuff? Or did they know full well all of the prophecy? They've watched Jesus, they know what's going on, and they went out to meet him. They're calling out, they're shouting out, they're yelling, they're singing to God because God's salvation has come today. Here's why I think they're doing that. We were reading in John 12. I want to go back to John chapter 7. Because in John chapter 7, it's just, uh, 
we don't know how long it is. It's, it's probably about two or three days, maybe a week before Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And we have John chapter 7 is the Feast of Booths. And so in John chapter 7, uh, Jesus and his disciples are heading to Jerusalem, and Jesus stops and said, I can't go to the Feast of Booths. You guys go. I can't go because it's not my time yet to be revealed. I think Jesus knows what's waiting for him. I, I think what Jesus is saying is he knows that the crowd is already stirred up and waiting and recognizing and wanting to make him king. And if he came in on the foal of a donkey at Feast of Booths, it's not his time yet. And that's what he says. So the disciples go, and they find all of Jerusalem talking about Jesus. Is he the Messiah? Is he the king? They're ready. They're all worked up. They're stirred up. Jesus quietly comes in halfway through this, the, the week festivities, and he's teaching in the temple. And guess what he teaches on? I am the Messiah. I am the one who has come to save the world. He's answering their questions right there. So this, this make him king idea is already brewing in them. And then if we look from, from John chapter 7, that festival of booths, uh, look at the next little bit. If you've got a Bible with chapter headings or, or t paragraph headings in there, look at them. There's, there's a feast of booths, and then Jesus teaches that I am the Messiah. Then he teaches I am the light of the world. Then he teaches I am before Abraham. Then he heals the blind man. And then he calls Lazarus from the dead. Mary anoints his feet in Bethany. And he comes into Jerusalem on the donkey. So Jesus knew that that festival is not his right time. But when Jesus rides into town, the people are ready and waiting and already worked up. They hear he's coming to Jerusalem. They go get the palm branches and they rush out to meet him. And they're saying, our Messiah King has come. Our time of peace and restoration has come. So, maybe in fairness, I'm still reading into it, okay? And, and putting coincidence together. But look at this, because there's more. What is one of the other things that the crowd did? We're still just talking about the crowd's preparation here. They, they get to Jesus, and, and they start laying their garments down on the road in front of him. Do you know what that means? I know some of you do. In, in Psalm, or, or sorry, in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 9, 2 Kings chapter 9, uh, we, we have the story of the coronation of one of their kings. It's Jehu, or Jehu, who's becoming king. And we see that first all of the captains of the army lay their garments down. And then we read this in 2 Kings chapter 9. Every man took his garment and put it under Jehu on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. There's no question that when the garments are laid down for someone to walk on like that, it is a coronation parade to the crown. This is what the people were doing. This is coronation day. They're ushering him with a bold statement and intentionality. We're getting the king. We're escorting him into Jerusalem. We're putting the crown on his head. That's what they're saying by that. So that part's all on the crowd. Okay. So whether they're in keen understanding or whether they're out to lunch or they're around for the ride, that's happening in Jerusalem heading towards the Mount of Olives. Okay. Let's flip it around and look at the other perspective. Here's Jesus with his disciples. And they're heading towards Jerusalem for the Passover, as it, as it says in John. And, he, and it says there, he says to his followers, You'll find a donkey with her colt, the colt of a donkey on which no one has ever ridden. There's a lot of significance in that too. We talked about this about three or four years ago, so it may not be new to some of you. But there's three or four things. Number one, riding a donkey like that, in that context, is for the kings. That's a very appropriate deal for a king. In 2 Samuel 
chapter 2, David actually says, donkeys are for the kings to ride. So Jesus riding in on a donkey is absolutely appropriate if he is king. The second thing is the way a king comes into town. The way a king rides into town is absolutely important because it means different things. If you were coming into town on a horse, that is a very different thing. Because a horse in that context represented strength and war and authority and power and conquering. So a king riding into his own town would be coming from battle, and if they were victorious, he would ride a horse, and the people would celebrate with a parade as he came in. Riding on a horse meant, we are victorious, we are the conquerors, it's strength and power and authority. Make sense? So if you were another town, and their king came riding into your town, that would immediately bring fear, because they're coming to conquer. All right, hold on to that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But if the king was riding a donkey, it signified peace and humility. It was a statement about the kind of king and the way he would lead. It was a statement on the time period. It was a statement on the kingdom and the nature of the kingdom. And and Matthew, and and I read earlier, Matthew quotes um, the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah, about 500 years before Jesus uh, was born, writes this. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, on the foal of a donkey. 500 years before Jesus, and Matthew, as he tells this story, sticks that in there to say that Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy. But in the Old Testament, all the way through, we see that horses were the sign of authority. Perfect example, when David was king, and his son Absalom was rising up in conspiracy against him and trying to take the, the, uh, the, the kingdom away from him. Absalom comes running into Jerusalem, riding into Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 15. He comes in with his army on a horse. And he's declaring himself king, and this is going to be power and authority and conquering. And I'm taken over. That's that statement. The Old Testament always associates the king and horses with war and pride. Jesus doesn't come in on a horse. He doesn't come in on a war horse, in a white horse marching into town. He comes in on a donkey. He comes in with the symbol of humility, humility and peace. And I'd love to to take a whole hour to get into this piece, but I won't. But I'll allow you to put two and two together here. All the way through their culture, uh, if Jesus was on the foal of a donkey that had never been ridden before, that never been ridden before part is critical. Because that made this acceptable for sacred purposes. That made this acceptable for religious sacrifice, for temple work. And so it was absolutely critical. Donkey, never been ridden for before on the, on the foal of a donkey. And, and Jesus comes in riding at Passover. And, and we see all of this, this imagery here, but, but in their Old Testament thinking, when the, when the Messiah comes from Zechariah, that passage I read, he will come on the foal of a donkey, but from, you put that together with their other passages, he will do that at Passover. So put all these pieces together, that's what Jesus was coming into town for, was Passover. He put all these pieces together. And and I want you to build this picture in your mind. Here is the Messiah's entry into town. And the Messiah's welcome by the people. We see the king's entry into town. And we see the king's welcome. And all of this celebration and craziness and singing. You're with me, right? You see what Jesus is doing over here? That the crowd has nothing to do with and doesn't even know about? And the crowd is preparing and coming this way. And they meet in the middle. And wow, what a coincidence, eh? God has everything perfectly put together. So look at this. They're laying clothes down. 
like it's coronation day of a new king. They're waving branches like it's the Feast of Booths, claiming that their Savior, their Messiah, is here. Their cultural image of, of the Messiah coming in riding on a donkey, calling out, rescue us now. The day of the kingdom is here. The cultural image of the king riding on the donkey and the cultural image of humility and peace, not war and power, and the sacred purposes and the timing of Passover as God has worked all of this together in perfect harmony. Here's the simplicity of this picture. There's a lot of things going on here. Jesus was claiming to be the God sent Messiah King. The people were declaring Jesus, the God sent Messiah King. Jesus was claiming to be the King in the line of David. The people were declaring him King and escorting him into town on a coronation honor parade. Do you wonder why the religious leaders and the Pharisees were so angry? They already wanted to kill him. And they're there, and they're seeing all of this happen. And, and this big crowd that is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, actually, let me pause there for a second, uh, to give you an idea uh, of Passover in Jerusalem in that day. It was law that if you lived within walking distance of Jerusalem, you had to be in Jerusalem for Passover. And 30 years later, in the Roman records, not in the Bible stuff, but in the Roman records, there's record that they counted 250,000 lambs were sacrificed during Passover in Jerusalem. The Jewish law was you had to have a minimum of 10 people for every lamb. How many people is that? That's 2.5 million people jammed into Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a big city. You can, you can get the idea of the immensity of this crowd and how stirred up they were in this building as they get closer. And it says in, in Matthew chapter 21, as they approached Jerusalem, the crowd was stirred up. Was stirred up. And the religious leaders are freaking out. Luke records part of that. And Luke says in verse 19, where did it go? It's not in verse 19. That's why it's stuck. The, the Pharisees said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. What is he saying? I, I think, honestly, I always assumed that meant, Shh, keep the noise down. This is getting a little too big. Okay, now, now go back over all the things we've talked about. Put it all together. The Pharisees are desperately trying to get Jesus out of the way to kill him. And they're there watching this crowd claim him king and lay their coats down. They're watching this crowd get into the festival uh, uh, the, uh, of Booth's activity, claiming him Messiah. And the crowd is getting bigger and bigger as they approach town, and the friends is going up, and the Pharisees are freaking out. And they're saying, Rabbi, stop this. Do you make sense? Because if this crowd continues, there will be no controlling it when they get to Jerusalem. And they do not want Jesus to be known as the Messiah. They do not want Jesus to be the king. They're trying to kill him. And so they say, come on. You've got to stop this. This is out of control. This was a huge deal. And how does Jesus answer? If they're quiet, the stones are going to cry out. Because today was his time. Today was his time. Now five chapters ago in chapter 7, it was not his time yet, and he knew that. And I think if he had come into town on that day, the crowd would have swelled in the same way. But it wasn't time yet. It had to be at the Passover. And it had to come in through the east gate. Because the sacrifice, sacrificial lambs all came from Bethlehem into the east gate. And that's where Jesus came in. But John chapter 7 to John chapter 12, that little passage there we see clearly as Jesus talks about what he is, who he is, why he's there, and sets itself up for the triumphal entry. But then look at what that triggers. Look at the sequence events coming out of that. 
That, that, that launches a sequence of events in Jerusalem that changes history. Because Jesus gets to Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is he goes into the temple and cleans the house again, second time. Kicks all the money makers out. This is a house of prayer. And then he sits down to teach, and he talks about the Son of Man needs to be lifted up to save the world from their sin. And then they go to the upper room, and he washes his disciples' feet. They celebrate the Passover together. He changes the Passover, and now it's about him and, and his blood and his body and the sacrifice. Then Judas leaves to betray him. They, he teaches them on the way to the garden about his highest priorities, and then they end up in the garden. He's arrested, and he's tried, and he's crucified. On this day, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey, that royal claim, that claim to be the King Messiah, forced Jerusalem to make a decision. And I think it does the same for us. Let's bring this into today, into us right here in our lives, in your life, in my life. Let's put away all the craziness uh, uh, of this picture and just rivet our eyes on Jesus. Do we declare Jesus king? King of you, king of your life, king of your wants and desires and family, king of your job and your decisions, king of your passions. Is he king? Because he's either king or he's not king. And, and, and this demanded Jerusalem make a decision. And that day, they were all over it. They were ready to bring him in and put the crown on him and put him on the throne. But what happened over the matter of the next three or four days? The entire crowd switched. And I can't help but think how, how often we do that same thing. Jesus comes riding into your life in gentleness, in humility, in peace, in forgiveness, in hope, in rescue to those who would make him Lord of their lives. But there's one other part to this story that I think is the best part. In, in all of this commotion, in all of this activity, as Jesus is riding into town, he gets to the place on the edge of the Mount of Olives where he can see Jerusalem. And he stops. And he weeps. This is in Luke as well. It says, When he drew, new, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, Jerusalem, even you, would that you had known on this day the things that make for peace, but they're hidden from your eyes. And then a couple of verses later, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he weeps. He's saying to them, you missed it. You miss, here you are celebrating Messiah and King is here. Tomorrow you missed it. I want to say Jesus comes riding into your life. Does he stop and weep? That image stuck in my brain all week. Does he stop and weep over us? For you and for me, this all begins with the understanding of who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. It demands a verdict because either Jesus is King Messiah or he's not. There's no in, in the middle and we all have that decision to make. And, we, and, it, and it means accepting him as our rescuer savior. But more than that, yes, there's forgiveness and there's cleansing and being right with God and that is absolutely necessary. We need that. But it also means that we make him our king and our Lord. I just wanted to say a lot of this 
Uh, I, there's several resources that I have where I get a lot of this historical stuff, and I wanted to point this one out. I've shown you this before. This is the Archaeological Study Bible. And on almost every single page, um, there is paragraphs and outlines and pictures of all kinds of this historical stuff. And if you look in Matthew 11 in this, it lays a lot of the, the, the things about the colt and the donkey and all that kind of stuff out here. These, these are available for you. This isn't just stuff that because I went to college and studied this, I, this is every week learning. This is one of the brilliant resources that I use. If you want to take a look at it, I'll have it up here. But here's what I want to say in conclusion. As I said, Jesus rides into your life. He came the first time he rode in Jerusalem in humility and in peace with forgiveness and with gentleness and with an invitation. But the Bible records the next time Jesus rides into town. And it's very different. It's in Revelation chapter 19. And if you remember all the things we talked about, look at this. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like the flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of fury and the wrath of God the Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The next time Jesus rides into town will be very different. It's not going to be humble and peaceful with grace and an invitation. It's a line in the sand saying, your time is done and it's judgment time. And as I think about the contrast be between those two things, I can't help but think, are we ready? Because we either look forward to that day excited, let's grab our palm branches and go, or we read that and we go, oh, my goodness, it's terrible. Are we ready? The next time Jesus comes, we'll be in judgment and in power. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this picture of humility and grace and peace, establishing your kingdom as a kingdom of peace, a kingdom where every single one of us is invited into, where you are king and you are Lord, where you serve your people like a servant with grace and peace and humility and forgiveness. Thank you. God, I pray that in all of us today, in, in, in each of our hearts and each of our heads, would we come to grips with the truth of who Jesus is. None of this happened by coincidence. You worked those two crowds perfectly in unison to meet in the middle for coronation day of Jesus as king. And then they killed him so that he could be the pure sacrificial lamb died on the cross to establish the kingdom. Thank you, Father, that you established your kingdom through sacrifice, not through war. Thank you for who you are. God, I pray that this morning, as I said, that each of us would know who Jesus is that we would come to you in humility, asking for your rescue, Hosanna, and to make you Lord and King. In Jesus' name, amen.